All right, guys, welcome back to the Chad and Mel movie hour. We're going to do Midsummer and we're going to do Straight Jacket. Wait, reverse that. We're going to start with Straight Jacket starring Joan Crawford, and then we're going to get into Ari Aster's newest Midsummer. So, Chad, welcome. Thank you. So, um, just a little intro on Straight Jacket. I had never heard of the movie until Chad had recommended it on our last movie hour and uh, loved it. I haven't seen too much Joan Crawford, but from what I've seen, like this is definitely like, obviously on the campier end, but it was still amazing. Right. Came out in 1964, um, directed by William Castle, I yeah. think. Yeah, Castle, okay. Um, yeah, do you wanna start? So he's with... like, just some backstory. He's like a John Waters favorite director, and he's Tingler where in, um, when they rolled the Tingler out into theaters, they put like, um, they elect, they put like some small voltage through some of the scenes. That's amazing. Like, on the and he, he actually sent out devices to all these theaters for them to install, um, uh, so that, you know, you would get a little jolt and... <laughs> I guess it was supposed to be like the tingler, like going through the theater, something like that. But he he did um, he had gimmicks like these for all his films. But I guess that's why John Waters like loved him. But that's awesome. Uh, it's very uh, honey. I shrunk the audience, but well ahead of its time, or like any any like four D experience at a theme park, like to have the seats like yes, interact with you. But you didn't know what seat. They didn't have enough money to do all the seats. Oh. So you have to, like, go and just, maybe you'll be buzzed or maybe not. If you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll get the vibrating chair. That's yeah. crazy. So have, have you seen his other movies? Any of those? I've got a couple box sets of his, and The Tingler is in there. And it's a silly movie, but if you put it in the context of everything I just said and how, how influential it was for like John Waters and other filmmakers and it's it's pretty cool it's pretty interesting um but yeah Straight Jacket like blew, like kind of blew my mind as a gay man but, when did you first see it how long ago oh so Straight Jacket I I only saw it like this year for the first time but I'm a huge fan of okay so backstory on that is I'm a huge fan of the camp movies like with Joan Crawford so Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, one of my all-time favorite movies. So when I saw, um, when I sort of discovered Straight Jacket, I was like, where has this been all my life? Because it's similar to like a Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I've seen like campy movies like that from that era, but I not with an A-list movie star like Joan Crawford. Like I've seen other kind of like B-ish campy like stuff, um, like Scream Queen even type stuff, but nothing with somebody of that caliber. And I was reading like some of the reviews that came out during the time. And I guess it was like, like critics just, they loved it. And they, they, uh, they didn't love the movie. They loved her. They thought like she was above the work. Um, but it was still, like fairly well received, but like one woman, I was reading this one critic and she like really came for Joan. She, what did she say? She's, <laughs> she said, Joan Crawford has picked some lemons, some very sour lemons in her day, but nigh the worst of the lot is straight jacket. It's likely to stand as the worst picture of the year. Apart from the absurdity of the plot and the chilling predictability of lines and situations is the movie is inexcusable for its scenes of violence. So she obviously had a stick up her ass, this Bosley. Right. Um, but everyone else loved it, but they still thought it was like, you what know, would, what would that And think of all the, how prevalent violence is now in cinema. I mean. Yeah, so I'm curious, like, if critics and audiences, like, when the movie came out, like, if it was, do you think it was received as campy even for its time? Or do you think, like, in retrospect, it's campy, but. I think they thought it was over the top at the time, but it's probably more so now just like because you have the kitsch factor and it's kind of sad actually because Joan Crawford is a screen legend and was already at that time and I think she was really a great actress and I think she was really just trying desperately to get opportunities after like her heyday when she was considered like you know 
older woman, it's really difficult for an older woman of that stature, especially back then, and probably even really today, to find like meaningful work. So I think like, you know, how almost how dare anyone come down on her for just trying to get by and just find something interesting to do. And you can't say that's not an interesting film, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I, in, in my women's group, we talked fairly recently, especially with like the E. Jean Carroll allegations that came out against Trump and then like disappeared overnight. Like, I mean, it's bad enough we don't like have a long news cycle, but that stuff was like a whisper in the wind. Like the invisibility of women over a certain age, even today. So right. like, to, to have to deal with it back then. And I don't know, did you ever watch the FX show with Jessica Lange and Susan Sarandon as Crawford and, um, who was the other chick? The other um, Davis. Thank you, Betty Davison. Yeah, yep. did you see it? Oh, of course. And I thought it was really well done and I love Susan Sarandon anyway. Um, I think they both did a great job. And again, of course, as a huge Baby Jane fan, like I loved it, but. Yeah, I think from the opening credits of the movie, um, which have like this, these like still art frames, these black and white kind of portraits, like horror portraits. And I was like taken aback by them. And I tried to find who the artist was and he's not in the credits. And I Googled it and do you know what I'm talking about? Let me hold, well, you're not gonna be able to see this from where you're sitting, but I'll send you the link. But the opening okay. credit, black and white stuff, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay, so like that, like just got me immediately because it was it like the quality of the mood that was being set didn't feel campy from the credits. It felt like oh shit, like something's gonna go down, and the scoring to the movie was incredible. It's interesting because like William Castle has this camp thing, but I don't think he he wasn't like consciously campy. So at the time, he was trying to be, or like, earnestly make a serious film that, in hindsight, it just happens to be really campy. As, right. as a, like a John Waters who kind of knows what he's doing, you know? Yeah, for sure. It makes me definitely need to put on the to-do list to see the other stuff. I'll start with the tingler, and uh, I'll set my vibrator under the chair. Um, uh, but... You're doing the thing, though, right? Whatever Same. happened to Game? yeah yeah of course yeah okay it's been a couple years but yeah yeah okay cool um the should we talk a little bit about like the, the plot or anything or like well i'll just i just am dying to say like one of my favorite parts of the film is um well i just like i just love her character in that film i mean and she's such a powerhouse of an actress and she can go so many places as an actress she's so like totally in control and it's like amazing to see but of course it's over the top but like it's still so well done yeah. and like I love when she's like flirting with her her daughter's boyfriend that whole scene is so crazy and then like later toward the end probably my favorite visual from the film is when they're at I guess her um daughter's boyfriend's parents house mm -hmm. she like gets lost in this maze of a room and like the pattern on the wall is like really intense and it becomes like a box that she can't even get out of. And it's like, she like, she's going crazy. And then of course, spoiler, you know, you have like this reveal at the end of the movie, which is like a whole nother twist or whatever. Um, but just the visual of that and like, and she's in a brassiere and like, I guess a slip or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love, I just love how that looks like, She's like holding onto the walls, like grasping for reality. Yeah, that was an excellent scene. And like even the dissolve, there's kind of like a dissolve that happens when they're, they pull up to the fiance or the boyfriend's parents' house and like it just kind of looks like it's turning like muddy and then she's yeah. in the room or in that box. I mean, it's also a little bit of art imitating reality, you know, as far as her career is concerned. Um, but yeah, like the vulnerability of it, like she's a woman half dressed at her vanity and she's like locked in this cage. And earlier in the movie, when she first gets out of the hospital and her daughter's showing her around the farm, and she says something to the effect of like, like she's trying to show her the chickens or something or the pigs. And she's like, I don't like to see things caged. And yeah. yeah. Uh, great point. 
That's a great point. And you know what else is interesting is that she starts off like an, an older woman, like almost matronly, like almost grandmotherly. But then her daughter asks her to, like she takes her shopping and she asks her to like revert back to this younger version that she remembered uh, at, when of how she looked as a mother when she was younger, before she was, um, you know, um, institutionalized or right. whatever. And it's interesting because it's almost like an older woman's caricature of a younger woman, but it also mirrors like, it's almost like if you look at it, Joan Crawford being this older woman who's an actress, caricaturing like her younger self as an actress when she was more accepted by Hollywood and when she was in her prime and more desired. It's like, there's like so many levels to it actually. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. It's super effing meta. It really is. Um, yeah. You know, within, it, like, within the plot of the movie and then you layer in like the art imitating her career as far as reality is concerned, it's, it's very meta. It's very ahead of its time as far as that's concerned. Um, I want to talk about the twist. So, I mean, th this is not a spoiler. This is a spoiler yeah. zone. Like people are going to know how to save space. Right. Um, but yeah, right. so uh, just for those who haven't seen the movie or who have, she plays Lucy Harbin who, uh, and we'll, I want to talk to you a little bit about this and what you think, but basically she comes home unexpectedly to find her younger husband in bed with another woman. There is a ax murder with uh, of, of both of those parties and her daughter, who is probably like between eight and 10 years old, I don't know, is watching this whole thing go down. And then it just flashes forward 20 years later to when she's being released after having been institutionalized for 20 years for these murders and just being kind of like dumped back into reality. And it's the fallout of what happens and um, kind of the, the attempt for her daughter and her to reconcile their relationship. Uh, but yes, in, as Chad like was saying, they, the daughter takes her shopping and takes her to a wig shop and puts her in a younger woman's hairstyle, puts her in the clothes and dresses her. Essentially, she too. remembers her. Yeah, interesting too that it's a wig because that just, it further emphasizes the artifice. Like, none of it's real. Mm -hmm. like, like, it's not like she dyed her hair and had it, like, curled. Like, it's a wig. Yeah. yeah, and there's even a moment where, like, they're walking out of the car to the beauty shop or something and uh, Joan Crawford's character, Lucy, says to her daughter, like, oh, I thought you had to make an appointment to get, you know, at a beauty parlor, and her daughter's like, oh, you're not getting a permanent, you know, you're gonna get a, a wig, it's like all, you know, everybody's doing it, so yes, yeah. definitely, like, I wonder, you think that that was intentional on his part, on Castle's part? I'm not sure, but it sure is interesting now, like, look, I mean, some of these things might have been happy accidents, but, yeah. um, it could certainly, I think it definitely could have been. I mean, so, it's like you said, I didn't even realize that they, they, they have a beat in the film where she's like, I thought we were going to a beauty parlor. Oh no, it's, it's going to be a wing. Yeah. That's interesting. It is just really interesting. And I mean, uh, yeah. spoiler alert, we're going to talk about the twist, but the leading up to the twist, there's a series of other axe murderers, excuse me, axe murders that take place throughout the course of the film in the present. Uh, and you're led to believe that every time Joan Crawford's character, Lucy, uh, gets dolled up, puts the new dress on, puts the wig on, she slips back into her axe murderous um, you know, mode, and when she's, yeah. she even says to her daughter, like, I, I can't dress like that, like, she warns her daughter, like, I can't be that person anymore, and you take it literally, because it, the movie is leading you to believe that every time she puts on that stuff, it's making, it's activating something dormant in her, and making her revert back to axe murderous mode, and then, boom, there's the twist at the end, do you want to talk about the twist, because I have yeah. questions about it. Okay, so the twist is um, that it's actually been, okay, so they set the daughter up as this very plain character. The, the daughter is this plain Jane type of actress, like a typical 50s, 60s, whatever actress. Um, very, like, unassuming, kind of bland, you know, in her place, just middle of the road. And then it turns out she's been committing the murders the whole time. 
So, um, and she's been doing it dressed up in the same artifice, like the same exact outfit, the same bangle um, bracelets, the same wig as the mother. And apparently she did this elaborate, like um, head sculpture of the mother. So she used that to create like this mask that she wears. So she, when you first see her as the killer, the daughter, she looks just like Joan Crawford. I mean, for a second, you're like, oh, is this some weird, like, artsy thing where, like, there's two Joan Crawfords, and then you realize that that's the daughter. It's so, it's so bizarre. But um, what's really cool is, is how they do it, because the whole movie starts with Joan killing someone, basically, so we know she can do it. So it really, like, sets us up to think she is doing it this whole time. And then you just never suspect the actress that they chose is like a killer. And then she kind of does pull it off at, at, in the end, I think. The, act, the actress shows that she has a lot more range than as an actress than what we kind of think in the beginning. But um, so that's it. That's the, we learned that the daughter is, has been killing the whole time. So I want to just totally agree with you. The, the actress that played the daughter, I, I had to IMDB a lot of stuff in the movie, but the doc, the daughter um, is played by Diane Baker, who when I saw her picture as like at currently, or as like a grown woman, I've seen her in, in other things. And I just didn't realize it was her. Um, but yeah, at the end when, you, when the twist happens and like uh, the daughter's name is Carol, is that the daughter's name, Carol? Yeah, I think so. The daughter is basically having this psychotic break where it she's been exposed as the real murderer, at least the murderer since her mom's been back in town and released from the institution. And you just see her have this mental break where she's like, I love you, I hate you, I love you. And it, you're right, like she re, you really see her like an opportunity to act where yeah. in the rest of the movie, it's just, you know. Like, like the cut out before exactly. that. And I wonder if that was an intentional move as well. But my question about the twist, well, I have two questions. So at the very, the very beginning of the movie opens with screaming, a woman screaming, no, 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 I'm not guilty. And then you see the murder, but they don't actually show Joan Crawford doing it. They show like they go style, like the shadow on the wall of the ax coming down right. on the two victims. And then, so did she in fact do it? I think is a valid question to ask. Um, or was she, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty fair to assume that she did, but. Well, yeah. no, I think, yes, it's a totally valid question. Um, the, well, the daughter was what, eight at the time or something? It, yeah. It probably wasn't her because we see the shadow. Right. It doesn't mean it was Joan either. Um, you're just kind of led to assume that it is, but. Yeah. After the descending, who knows? And also given the context of the time and women not being taken seriously, especially women of a certain age, you know, uh, a woman could have been institutionalized for a much lesser crime or a much lesser just behavior in general uh, that during that era. But also, you know, I, I think when you see the twist at the end and you see that whatever the daughter did witness, whether it was Joan Crawford, whether it was Lucy or not, the daughter was obviously impacted and traumatized and has major PTSD. Um, but, you know, the commentary on like mental illness and like how it passes, it's passed down or inherited versus like, um, right. It, is it a nature or nurture thing or is it a both and? Um, yeah, but at the end, you know, the, the twist at the end, I honestly have to tell you, didn't see it coming. That's fabulous. I didn't either, but then after it happened, I was like, you know, I'm not good at, I'm not good at, um, you know, seeing a twist about to happen anyway. So I thought maybe it was just me, but that's good that you didn't see it either. No, I'm really not good at that for the most part either, because I just kind of, my brain turns off and I'm very present when I watch a movie. So, right. I'm not, like, so you don't like, watch the movie in your mind. Mind. Yeah. I, I mean, unless it's super obvious or unless it's like a super like midsummer where I know I'm going to get a twist or, like, and I right. need to pay attention to every fucking detail. Right. I usually am just like 
in the moment in a very like good way, but it makes me like. And I think that's a great way to find to see the twists. But don't you think that's the best way to watch film is to just let it like, like almost moment by moment. I think so. And I mean, it served me well, but yeah, I mean, I think so. Uh The only other thing I wanted to mention is it was interesting and I'm sure this was indicative of the times, but there was, there was two points in the movie, both fairly early on. Um, one where uh, they're talking about uh, Lucy as a murderer, but they don't use the term murderer. They very specifically use the term murderess. And there's a point also when Lucy gets out and her daughter's showing her around the, the farm in the house and showing her her sculptures. And uh, she says, oh, you're a sculptor to her daughter. And her daughter says, no, I'm a sculptress. So I'm wondering, because like, it seems to me in 2019, we're doing the opposite, right? Like I don't need to be called an actress or a comedian. Like I am an actor. Like I don't need to be separated from the male or, or the normal term. Whereas we had to maybe go through the process of separating to get back where we are if that makes sense so i would like why did the daughter insist on like reverting i'm a i'm a sculptress <laughs> yeah so- but I, I love those terms though like and i love the term murderess it's so sexy and it's like so like villainy and campy and like right. like delicious it's a delicious word and it just there's something more and this leads into movies like Midsummer or The Nightingale, but it, it's 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 a larger conversation. But it's like this idea of like the like woman as inherently evil because of Eve, you know? Like it's, right. it's just I don't know. It's just very rich and juicy. I love it. So I have I think we can move on, uh, but I have one more thing to say about Straight Jacket before we move on. Get it. Um, so the parallels, so you can draw so many parallels between, and I don't know if you encountered this in any of your research, um, but between Psycho and Straight Jacket. So Straight Jacket is like a rearranged Psycho in a lot of ways. So in Psycho, he is playing, like he, I forget exactly how they did this, but I was reading and there's a way you can look at Straight Jacket as like a total retelling of Psycho. And I think it was because he was dressing up as his mom, but she is the mom and she's dressing up as her younger self. So they just kind of flipped a few things around. I have to, I had to grab ET for this. Okay, I have to rewatch the movie now. But now, but what I should really do is re read what I read because it was so, it was laid out really well and now I can't remember it. But I love, of course I love Psycho. So that is such a, all-time classic and um I just love all those things of like all those like shocking films from back then that like oh he was a transvestite (laughs) or these like really weird things are like you know what I mean oh no it was the daughter the whole time you know and it's just like I don't know it could just like the like the the simplicity but like the brilliance of just like a bait and switch twist like we take that for granted because we've evolved since right. then. Also, like at that time just how shocking like cross-dressing was for example yeah um, or like female like uh, a female cutting someone's head off those things from those two movies were like extremely shocking back then yeah I mean they're still shocking for, but I, mean, I can only yeah. imagine being an audience member back then and seeing I mean shit to see even the exorcist my mom still like tells me to this day like right. there's no way to understand how much that movie impacted audiences psychologically. The closest that I can come to is like Jaws. Cause I know, I remember seeing Jaws like early as a kid, it had already been out, but like the, the impact it had on the collective psyche and still has today on sharks and, and all of that. Like I can't imagine 50, 60 years ago. Oh yeah, and I often think, you know, my favorite film is Alien. So I I often think, because I've heard a lot of stories about when it was first released, like how visceral and intense it was. Like people were literally crawling out of the theater, down the aisle, like 
to get out or they were vomiting. Like, could you imagine that ever happen, happening today? It just does not happen today. So, like, to go back in time and see Alien for the first time or The Exorcist, there are some of these films that had that level of intense reaction. Just, it's, like, mind-blowing. But yeah, how, it is. How- yeah, I mean, we have obviously been anesthetized and have become numb to gore and horror to a certain extent, well, to an extreme extent. And I think that's why movies like, I mean, this is a good segue um, into Midsummer, and I think that's why movies like Hereditary and Midsummer, The Witch, which Marissa and, and um, Sean made me watch, oh, like more heady, like philosophical, metaphysical, like are deep, like we need that because like blood and guts isn't doing it for us. Like we need something to like awaken our inner trauma. You know, it's, it's gotten to that point for better or worse. That's a different conversation. Right. It's a good right. second. Cause they're so much more sophisticated now, but yes, 